Welcome to the Deep Dive Spirituality Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Brian Russell, and today it's my privilege to have as my guest, Brandon Tomlin. Brandon's a podcaster. He's the host of the Strong Stoic podcast. He's also a member and one of the resident philosophers at the Walled Garden, which you'll hear more about as we get into our conversation. Brandon's also an engineer and a strength coach. We talk about stoicism, Russian literature, and essentially have a rich conversation around topics that matter to having a philosophy as a way of life. If I can be of any service to you, please reach out to me. You can check out my website at brianrussellphd.com or email me directly at brian at brianrussellphd.com. Also, if you're interested in Centering Prayer, I'd like to invite you to the monthly Centering Prayer gathering that I co-host with another Centering Prayer author, Rich Lewis. We host that typically on the third Saturday of most months, but if you'd like to be on the list to get an invitation, sign up at centeringprayerbook.com. I hope you enjoy uh, the following conversation. Welcome to the Deep Dive Spirituality Conversations podcast, Brandon. Hey, thank you very much. I'm so excited to be here. Um, I, you've been on my podcast. We had a great conversation. Very looking for, very much looking forward to talking with you again. Yeah, likewise, and thank you. And uh, let's let's just get some background a little bit. I love uh, where you uh, uh, your kind of origin story that you've just shared a little bit. You grew up in a fishing village in the maritime provinces of of, of Canada. So you know, talk a little bit about your own journey that led you to grow up you're an engineer uh philosopher strength coach and you know weave in you know like some of the lessons you learned growing up uh with a a dad who was a fish a professional fisherman and uh and then um you know how that set you up to be who you are today sure yeah well i'll start with the roots i guess but yeah i grew up in a fishing village my father was a fisherman uh very hard working very unforgiving industry uh and i suppose uh you know, in this industry, as we we briefly talked about before, there's a lot of philosophical principles that are sort of embedded into the nature of the job. I know you you said you you grew up as a farmer as well. And I I would call these professions humbling, very humbling, literally feet in the ground kind of thing, right? And in my case, it would be more like hands in the water back to the back to the wind, or back to the land face to the wind more like it. But it was very clear to me growing up that and distilled in me that character was really the most important thing in life and it was very much true in fishing because you really needed to rely on each other for various things as i mentioned it's very unforgiving uh and so you run into issues with weather you want to run into issues with maybe your your boat breaks down or something like that and that's a great example if your boat breaks down when you're out fishing who are you going to call i mean sure you could call the coast guard but in a lot of these rural areas that's not very realistic to uh, to expect them to come ASAP so you call your buddies you call your fellow fishermen that are out fishing hauling their gear and you say hey listen I need a hand and and the only way that you can really ask for help in such a situation is if you kind of get along with everyone if you're very pro-social and that doesn't mean that you go out and hang out with people all the time but certainly you need to have a good reputation people need to think of you as someone that is fundamentally a good person. And so I've always seen that growing up that uh, that a, a good character, there's really no replacement for it, period. And I, I would see this with, with my father and, you know, if someone had a flat tire or someone was stuck in the beach with, with, uh, with their vehicles, which happened a lot because we had a beach by my house that you could actually drive on, um, you know, he would always stop and didn't matter who they were, didn't even ask. It was, let's help this person out. And I think that I've seen that so much growing up that it really gave me the the foundations for something like stoicism, which is, if I had to pick one, would probably be my philosophy of life. So I hope that's a great little start. Yeah, and so and and you also just mentioned the idea of like uh, you know good character, and obviously stoicism has a lot to do with that. Like um, you talk, you had you mentioned your father. Like, what were some other models and mentors for you as you know you grew up, or even probably before you ever heard of stoicism or even philosophy? Like, what what was a good character? Uh, what did good character look like for you? Well, I think I think a dedication to truth was a big one. You know, I've seen, uh, we've had family friends that were, they were just very honest, very truthful, 
but also very generous and helpful as well. You know, these are sort of the uh, age old religious virtues, right? Generosity and, and, and a dedication to truth. And I, but I would say probably the most fundamental, if I think about it is something more like a pro social attitude. It's, it's not, you know, you're not closing yourself off from the world. You're very much engaged into the world. And again, that doesn't mean that you have to talk with everyone or be friends with everyone. But what it means is that you have to kind of get out there and, and talk with people and help people if you can. And, and maybe, you know, if you're lucky, you have people that can actually give you a hand. So, and I think that's fundamentally a, a stoic principle, this idea of, of really being pro-social. What are you doing, not just for yourself, not selfishly, but also for the rest of the world? And, um, and yeah, I mean, you know, truth, fairness, generosity, uh, and I mean, I could even go to the, the stoic virtues as well, with like a dedication to justice, uh, to, a temperance wisdom, of course, which is an important thing, but, but certainly, uh, I would say that, that those elements are what I saw mostly growing up. And you went into engineering, uh, and, um, I don't exactly remember exactly the type of engineering. So you did a, a lot of STEM, a lot of science stuff. So at what point did you begin actually reading philosophers? I've read your reading list. You have Nietzsche, you have, you know, just the, the classics on there, all the Stoics. So connect your, I mean, just your profession, your academic background and training with uh, this love for uh, philosophy. Yeah. So I guess you could say I fell backwards into engineering in a sense. Uh, I feel like I'd, I've done that for a lot of things in my life, but uh, I went into engineering. I was really just skilled in math and physics mm -hmm. in high school. So it, it was just a natural progression for me. And it actually turned out to be a really well-suited thing, but it's, it's not like I was, you know, a super, uh, uh, I wasn't a fortune teller. Like I didn't know that this would work out for me. I kind of just, I suppose, got lucky in a sense that the right people told me to, to do engineering. And it, it ended up being something that I was, I ended up being quite good at. And then I kind of dedicated very wholeheartedly to engineering for five years. That's the whole engineering degree. And I graduated, did a bit of work for about a year and a half, I suppose. And I was, that was a phase of my life where I was sort of like, you know, I've been working really hard for most of my life trying to get this engineering degree and, and everything that led up to that. I kind of need a little bit of a breather. And I ended up getting very intellectually bored. And it was actually, I started seeing some things um, online that really sparked my interest. Uh, I, I had known about Marcus Aurelius for a while and some of these Stoic philosophers, but I didn't really, very egotistically of me, I didn't really see it as like a, a very challenging thing. And then when I started to kind of dig into some of this a little bit, I really started to realize just how little I, I didn't know. And it was almost like, and I still feel this way, engineering is kind of like the polar opposite of philosophy. They're, they're, they're like kind of completely different things. And so I, I realized that, you know, I certainly had a philosophy as a way of life, but there were so many things that I just didn't know. And that caused me to really dig deep into some of these philosophers, uh, Nietzsche, as you mentioned, but also the Stoic philosopher, Seneca, Marx Aurelius, really big into Peterson's work and, and the psychologist, Carl Jung. And I'm still... I'm still very much a learner in, in all of these regards. No, and again, that's I guess why I enjoyed talking with you because I mean I read a lot of the, the the same things, and I don't know if I had told you previously, but I, I before I uh, moved towards uh, I felt called a ministry, but I was in engineering school myself. I don't know if I said that to you, so it's like I was the same thing. I was yeah. really good at math and science, and I just kind of slowly backed into these. But one of the things that impressed me when I was on your podcast. We'll come back to the stoicism in, in philosophy, minute, but it was just um, your love for uh, Dostoevsky and literature. And, and, and even on, I mean, we'll talk about the walled garden at some point here, the, the group that you're in, but on your, your little profile page on the walled garden, you actually have a whole section that says tribute to Fyodor Dostoevsky. And you have a quote, and I thought we'd just kind of start with this quote, actually, uh, above all, don't lie to yourself. The man who lies to himself and listens to his own lie comes to a point that he cannot distinguish the truth within him or around him and so loses all respect for himself and for others and having no respect he ceases uh, to love. Uh, again, I just throw that out as a caveat to let's talk a little uh, Russian literature. And uh, that's, well, he has so many brutal quotations that you could pull out, but that's uh, such a great one. What does that quotation itself really mean to you? And 
why out of all the things that you could have quoted from Dostoevsky, is, is that the one that gets highlighted on kind of your profile? Yeah, and that, that quote, like a lot of his, just it just breaks me into pieces. And every time I hear that read to me or if I'm reading it, it just breaks me into pieces because, you know, he says, he says right from the start, above all, don't lie to yourself. And that's very interesting because you might think, well, how can you lie to yourself, <laughs> right? This is something people think all the time. How do I lie to myself? And I think if you really become conscious of your thoughts on a day-to-day -day basis, you lie to yourself pretty often about things. Normally, it's something to do with ego and unwillingness to accept your own insufficiency, let's say. And part of that, well, it is, is to, is to protect your ego, which is a very, uh, uh, like, I guess, a fundamental drive to, to make sure that we think we know what we're talking about. But I think what Dostoevsky pointed out in that quote was that if you lie to yourself, the real danger in that is that eventually you get to a place where you can't distinguish lie from falsehood or, or sorry, lie from truth or truth from falsehood. Maybe that's a better way of saying it. So if you think about that, that's a very dangerous road to go down. If you can no longer distinguish truth from falsehood, how do you even know what to do in life? Like, how can you even navigate? And then, so we've already said, uh, as, as I mentioned before, we lie to ourselves all the time. And yet, if you do that enough, there's a real danger in that, in that you no longer know truth from falsehood. And then you might say, as Dostoevsky said, then you can't figure out how to love. Then you lose the capacity to love. Because if you don't know truth from falsehood, you cannot possibly bring yourself closer to what the Stoics would say a state of flourishing. And it just, it was so interesting to me that Dostoevsky, he, Dostoevsky, he brought this right back to the most simplest thing, the thoughts in your head. It's like, don't lie to yourself. And I'll just give a quick example because, you know, I, I think a lot of people struggle with understanding how we lie to ourselves, but, you know, here's a great example that I've given in the past. There was a time with my work where uh, there was something I was supposed to do in the evening and I was really, really overworked at the time. I was really exhausted. And I knew that if I didn't do it, my coworkers would, would do it. So I knew that it would get done. Like it wasn't going to be a catastrophe. And I ended up just, just not doing it. And, you know, I'm embarrassed about that. I'm not proud of that, but I just, I just didn't do it. And they, they finished it for me. And it wasn't a huge thing, but it was significant. So then the next day after that, you know, you kind of think back and you say, well, you know, I was exhausted or, well, they would have been okay without me, blah, blah, blah. But all that really is doing is lying to myself because at the end of the day, I should have just done that thing that I was responsible to, to do, or I should have called my coworkers and said, listen, I'm really exhausted. I'm not, I can't do this tonight. I'm, I just need a rest day. Can you guys ha handle it without me? But instead for about four or five days, I lie to myself to defend my ego. Well, how, how could I do something wrong? How could I be insufficient? How could I not uh, do something that I had to do? How, how could I possibly be negligent when the reality was actually, no, I, I was negligent in that scenario. And so for about four or five days, um, my head is just spinning, basically trying to make up excuses for why I was, I was insufficient in this particular task. And eventually you have to face reality and you have to look yourself in the mirror and you have to say, no, that was wrong. And that's hard because that means that you did something wrong. And that means that you have something to work on. That means that you're not so perfect after all. And um, I think I think really that's a great example of what Dostoevsky is saying here. Don't lie to yourself. No, that's so good. And so beyond just, I mean, Dostoevsky has such penetrating characters. And again, I'm not going to pretend like I've read his stuff. I've been a dabbler. My daughter, I think I told you, loves Dostoevsky. And I've had a, another guest that thinks the brothers Karamazov or Harvey said is the one of the, is the greatest book ever written. And uh, so how did, how do you, how did you get drawn to Dostoevsky? Cause when I just think about the themes he writes about, they're often dark. I mean, he, um, and, and then on your reading list, you go like I do, I have started and I know a little bit about the, 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 one, the, the notes from the underground, which I think is even one of maybe his darkest work in some ways. So what draws, you know, a philosopher, a kind of a successful guy, a guy who loves to wisdom to that type of literature? I, I suppose the simple answer would be that I learn 
a lot of ugly truths about myself when I mm. read Dostoevsky. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And that's um, Notes from Underground. It's my favorite book. And I'm, I'm, we got to talk after you finish it. <laughs> uh, but the reason why that one resonates with me so much and I love it so much is not because I'm reading it like I'm reading Harry Potter and I'm filled with lore and I'm filled with adventure, you know, because I love Harry Potter as well. But I'm reading Notes from Underground and I'm not I'm not filled with this sense of like adventure. I'm filled with this sense of of dread because the things that he's talking about, I've I've felt before. So just, just for those who don't know, this is a book about the most resentful person that you can imagine, the anti-hero, the antichrist. He's a guy that's just basically he's lied to himself for so long. He's been so bitter and resentful. He hasn't he hasn't been a virtuous person and he's locked himself underground. And the only person he has to talk to is himself. So he's writing notes, just expressing his bitterness and 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 resentment. And so it's the antihero. It's the person that you don't want to be. And so I'm reading this thing and he's he's going over like his history and very deep into what he's thinking and if you read Dostoevsky, the scariest thing, especially this book, is, as I mentioned, you'll start to notice a few thoughts that you've had as well. You'll start to like, oh, that sounds familiar. Like, have I felt like that before? And if you're really conscious, a lot of the stuff you do, because I think, you know, underneath all of us, I think there is this temptation to resentment, this temptation to be to be bitter about things, to um, uh to, well, so in the extreme to burn the world down, I think. And that's really what, what the extreme is. It's someone that's so bitter that they don't even want the good to exist anymore. And that's, that's a very dark place to go, but that's really where this character went. So I, I, I suppose just to kind of finish it off, I learn a lot about myself by reading Dostoevsky and they're not good things about myself, but I guess the whole purpose of it is so that I can become conscious of it and make sure that I don't become the underground man, because as painful as it is for me to read notes from underground and have to deal with the mental anguish and, and the self-development that it's going to take to address some of those thoughts, it's much better than actually becoming the underground man. That's good. That's good. And I guess you could say the same about reading a book like Crime or Crime and Punishment or uh, and uh, again, for folks that don't know, I mean, Dostoevsky has an interesting life. He was dabbled in radicalism in pre-revolutionary um, um, Russia. He actually, I mean, I just can't even imagine what going through a mock execution would have been like, where the one, I think one of the people that was there with him never regained their sanity and uh, just, you know, literally thinking you're dying and then you're not. I just can't imagine what that would do. And then he had various problems. Um, how, 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 what's your sense, again, as a um, appreciator of his literature, I know you're not like a, 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 an ex, an expert, even though you've read, you yeah. are in some ways more than most people. Like what, what's your sense? How was he able to channel these deep characters? Do you have any thoughts about that? Cause uh, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, like, like my Christian listeners, like in, in the brothers, how do you say it's camera? Kar Amazov. How do you say that the actual Karam book? Karamazov, I think Karamazov. that's one of those Russian words that I, yeah. I just look at it as a symbol. I try don't try and pronounce it. <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah, that's really true. That's one of the hard things about reading his books. So you get all these names and stuff too. But uh, but he has like the that Grand Inquisitor scene, which some people would say is the most honest, actually, argument against God's existence. And then at some level, Dostoevsky is actually at his roots a Christian who believes in the God of love, but he includes this. I mean, the, the best argument that you can come up with about God's right. non-existence. And so like, you know, how, how do you think he ch was able to channel all that stuff? Any, any thoughts? It's a great, it's a great question. And I think in Dostoevsky's case, as is the case with a lot of these, which honestly scares me quite a bit is I think they just had a really tough life. I, I think, you know, Dostoevsky also said that if you have intelligence and a deep heart that you suffer greatly on earth. Wow. And he, he, and he didn't say that half wittingly. He, he meant that. And he knew that from experience, but I've read, I started reading his letters recently, which is letters to his, um, to his family mostly. And he's always been this, even from a young kid, you know, he's very deep, very poetic in how he thinks and, and speaks and writes rather. But, um, but yeah, I, I've come to know that crime and punishment, for example, he kind of went through a bit of struggle with poverty growing up. And so his, his feelings in 
in the or, or rather what the character was feeling in crime and punishment this di these dire circumstances no money you know embarrassment about that i think dostoevsky felt a lot of that growing up so he he knew this from experience and also as you mentioned that mock ex execution that actually traumatized him quite a bit to the point where he could dig psychologically deep into a lot more things so he was always very a very deep thinker but then he had this mock execution and i've done some meditation on that you know being collected by the police being put in front of a, a few guns thinking you're going to die they count it down they click and they, there's a bang because they put in fake bullets and then somehow you're still alive basically what that did for him was was change his, his neuroscience in a way there's a great passage i can i can send you later in affective neuroscience but it did allow him to dig a bit deeper into these experiences so you take someone that was naturally just very deep very smart and you put him through a mock execution and you end up with Dostoevsky, the, the, the genius. Yeah. And just to be clear, when we say mock execution, the whole thing is you don't know it's a mock until you actually go through it. And I didn't even know they put, a, I thought it was just a click. I didn't realize they had a blank or something. So it's almost like, is, have you dug, is it like an ego death experience in some ways? So you just obliterate your ego, but, and, and then if you can actually come back into your body, which again, one of the guys that was with him, never was able to become a whole again is that what actually happens in some way so you're just broken i think it's just a like you mentioned a massive ego death it's you know a lot of us have these little touches with death throughout our lives like maybe you almost get into a car accident maybe you're someone close in your family you have to watch them die at a very young age or something or at any age mm -hmm. and you, you kind of get these little brushes with death but if you think about a mock execution that's about as close as you can get and still live. And then to on compounded, he was sent to the gulags or whatever they were called back then for a season too. So he goes, he, he's alive and then he doesn't get to go to a nice cozy psychiatric uh, chair and get put back together. He gets shipped off to a labor camp in Siberia or something for a number of years. Right. And right. Yeah. Very poor working conditions. Uh, I mean, a lot of, a lot of people don't, don't know too much about the gulag, but, the greatest example is like the a concentration camp that, that the Nazis did. It's very similar. Uh, the, the only difference being is that they didn't execute people on site. It was, it was just the working conditions. So they were working very, very difficult, like all day labor, weren't getting fed very well, very getting mistreated by the guards, that sort of thing. And so like, why, why would you say uh, folks listening maybe might want to dabble with uh, Dostoevsky and, and, you know, you, you kind of gave a great reason either to avoid notes from the underground or to start there with the way you described it. Like, like what if, if you weren't sure you wanted to dive right into a book like that, um, would, would you rec which which of his books would you recommend that somebody start with? That's a great question. I would probably go for I mean, I haven't read all of his work. I've read most of his work, but there's a lot to take on with him, right? Because the, the brothers Karamazov, that's a massive, it's like 1200 pages, right? So yeah. it's, it's nothing small. Crime and Punishment is still a long book, but I think it's a bit, it's still dark, but it's not as dark. Uh, I think for people that are interested in kind of diving maybe a little deep into the, into the darkness, I still think Notes from Underground is, is a great place to start just because it's pretty short it's, it's a little separate from Dostoevsky's material because you don't have to learn like about a lot of background material on the, uh, on the characters. It's pretty much just like, a, I think it's less than a hundred pages. Most of his books are over a thousand. So uh, it's a pretty short investment and it'll get you intro introduced to his style of writing. And in my opinion, it's, it's also, I mean, it, it's been the most impactful for me. Brothers Karamazov is a great book. Great, great. Probably the greatest book, but for me personally, Notes from Underground has been very impactful. What are some other um, literary uh, literature uh, books of literature that you actually uh, found helpful in your philosophical and personal journey? Yeah. So as you and I spoke about there on my podcast, uh, the Gulag Archipelago was very impactful. Solzhenitsyn took me through a journey that was just absolutely brutal. And he really described the conditions to a point where you can really understand how some of these systems fall apart. And then he also, for me, really, really put, really put into my head that sort of like the stoic idea that you can, 
you can go through some very terrible things in life and still come out on top, you know, and that, you know, Solzhenitsyn went through the gulag, which again was these, these terrible working conditions, but somehow managed to have the perspective that he wasn't a victim. You know, when you think about that, you think about people today and a lot of our mentality is we're all victims and there's probably truth to that. There's, there's sure. I mean, even if you have, let's say the greatest life, you're still going to die at the end of it. So sure. We could all argue that we're all victims, but then you look at someone like Solzhenitsyn who really went through one of the most terrible things that you can go through, but didn't consider himself a victim. And, and it was even worse than that or, or better. Rather, he looked at his prison guards, the same ones that were mistreating him, and he didn't hate them. He took, he took pity on them. He felt sorry for them because if we look at life as being the purpose of it, being the development of your character, the development of your soul, who's worse off than the prison guard who's torturing you, who's basically resorted to barbarous ways. And that that's something that Solzhenitsyn really, really just put into my head, which was, which was amazing. And uh, you also noticed in your list, you like George Orwell, or are there other, can you say a little bit about some of the other fiction that you find helpful also? Yeah, George Orwell as well. I mean, uh, you know, the Lord of the Rings, I'm really big into fantasy as well. Uh, Harry Potter and, and, and Star Wars. I'm a big nerd on that front, but, um, but yeah, George Orwell as, uh, as well. Anything for me, I like fiction that can really dig deep into uh, psychology. And that's why I'm, I'm such a big fan of Dostoevsky, but anything that really can make you learn about yourself. I think that's the biggest takeaway that I get from fiction. It's, it's, it's learning human nature. It's good. But it's also learning that you are a human. So you have the capacity to experience the same feelings that those people are experiencing, whether they're good or whether they're evil, quote, quote, evil. So, uh, you know, I, I, I try and use fiction as a, as a mirror to myself, I suppose. And you also mentioned uh, you, you're, you enjoy Carl Jung's psychology. And I just noticed there seems to be a renaissance of, of Jungian thinking. I mean, it's never completely gone out of style, but I hear a lot of, um, I mean, I'm a little bit older than you, but I hear a lot of younger uh, folks um, that are really interested in his archetypes. Um, I know Jordan Peterson, who you, I know you mentioned him. He talks a lot about Jung. Is it, do you think it's just Peterson's influence or what is it about Jung? He seems to be having at least a mini revival, at least in some parts of the population, uh, folks that are looking to, to grow and understand them better. Like what attracts you to Jung and, uh, you know, what are some takeaways that you've had that have helped you? Yeah, I, I think Peterson has been a huge, uh, a huge proponent of the success, the recent, let's say resurgence of Jungian psychology. For me personally, I, I find his talk on the shadow, which really fits in well with the Dostoevsky stuff has been very yeah. impactful. You know, he had this idea that we all, we all have a bit of evil within us, which is a very Christian idea as well. But he also thought that if you were unconscious of it, that was the biggest danger. So it's, it's not so much that we all have the capacity for evil, it's that we're unaware of it. Because if we're unaware of it, we don't know where it goes. And, you know, he talked a lot about scapegoats, how if we don't accept that we have the capacity for evil, we end up scapegoating it on someone else. We say someone else is entirely evil. And then we, we basically make a witch trial, you know, it's like a witch trial, a witch hunt. We go on a witch hunt for people uh, because we're unwilling to accept our own capacity for evil. So that's been the biggest takeaway for me. And he talks a lot about integration of evil, which I'm, I'm quite fascinated with, but it's a very abstract idea because you might think, well, how can you, <laughs> how can you integrate your evil in such a way to benefit the world or even, even well, neutralize it, but if you can have it benefit the world and you know, think about something like something like anger issues that people have. So you can take, if you have anger issues and let's say you're trying to address it with philosophy, but you still get these outbursts from time to time that's a shadow. But if you take a minute and you learn how to address that, even if you can remove yourself from the situation, back away, you know, go for a walk, just be alone until you can kind of get down off this. You're kind of neutralizing the negative effects of that shadow. But then you could also take it a step further. You can say, well, what if I channel this 
into something like strength sports? Or what if I challenge this into, you know, uh, hitting a heavy bag? And maybe that's not a permanent solution, but maybe it's a maybe it's a channel to kind of get rid of some of that vice. Certainly, if you're if you're a youngie and you think that you can't get rid of your evil at all, so you have to channel it in some way and, and build it up. Well, then you're taking that evil, that capacity for evil, and you're using it in a way that actually is beneficial for you in your life. So it sounds wonky. It sounds crazy. Like integrate your evil to do good. But it's definitely within the realm of possibility if you get down to the practicality of it. Yeah, you know, and it's really interesting, um, even from a, a Christian perspective, we start talking about evil and sin and, and such, and uh, it's often a lot of suppression in, 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 the, in the Christ fall movement, just because people, I'm a Christian, I can't, you know, I did something, but now I can never talk about it. So I suppress it. I suppose it goes all the way back to even the story, Adam and Eve, they hide behind the trees. <laughs> Right. When God comes walking around the garden, like you can't see him or whatever. Uh, but, you know, and it's really interesting. Um, there's a famous Bible verse. It's Romans 8, 28. It says, um, we know in all things, God works together for the good of um, those who love him, who are called according to his purposes. It's the idea that all things are good. And St. Augustine, um, in, uh, on a commentary on that verse, really interestingly adds at the very end, even our sins. So even our sins can be the means that God works for good. And uh, again, he wasn't a Jungian person, but um, at some level, it seems like you can't actually break a habit sometimes until you love it. Um, you know, I'm doing an addictions class right now. I was talking to you and, and, and I, one of the things that I didn't know is like one of the first things to do when you're helping somebody with an addiction is, you know, you don't tell them to stop, you actually try to get them to express what all the good things it does for them, so that they can own wow. the, the weight of what they get out of the substance. Otherwise, if you only say it's bad, you just jamming it down, and you can never break out of it. And, uh, you know, and I just noticed, um, I don't know, I've been I've noticed my own soul, how it's developed and even other people. And oftentimes until you love the thing that you wish you could rid yourself of, you never gain, you never gain any agency over it. And it, and it, uh, and it seems like Jung somehow was able to get that insight early on. That's yeah, that's amazing. I didn't, I didn't know that with the addiction thing that you have to, I mean, it, it entirely makes sense. Cause I can imagine if you have this, this addiction, you do only want to think about it as bad, but it doesn't really align with your actions because if you keep going back to it, it must do something for you. Maybe that thing is constructive. Maybe it's de destructive. Let's say in the final analysis, it's probably destructive. Yes, yes. But certainly there's got to be some kind of benefit that you get from that, even if it's something as simple as numbing the pain. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, and I just I, I find the shadow stuff just utterly fascinating to 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 talk about. Um, let's some um, segue though, and maybe we'll come back and talk about that at even another time because I'd love to get even deeper and do a whole podcast on um, on shadow work and stuff that seems so important today. But I definitely want to talk to you about stoicism, and that's how we met. You have the Strong Stoic uh, podcast, and I'll put a link to that in the in the show notes uh, for today. Again, just to get. Uh, started on that. I, uh, I'd like to hear about how you um, were attracted to it. But on on the walled garden, you have a nice little quote. That's uh, these are your words um, when you talk about what stoicism is, and um, you know it's in its response to a question: How should we act such that we have the best chances of flourishing? And then regarding stoicism, you say we might say that stoicism is a philosophy that aims to create a life in which you fit in beautifully and orderly with the world around you. That can mean that sometimes events that are best for the cosmos are not the best for you individually. It also means that we all need to get along with each other. Yes, even with the rude and ungrateful among us. Um, you know, I just love that as a, a, a kind of a hip pocket a version of stoicism. Unpack that a little bit and, and just talk about what ultimately attracted uh, you to stoicism and maybe talk a little bit about some of your favorite authors and I'll just do some follow-ups as, uh, uh, as needed. Sure. Well, I, I think, I mean, to fit in beautifully with the world around you, I think that's really fundamentally the, the Stoic doctrine. And they believe that if you do that, you're going to flourish. Things are going to work out pretty well for you. I often use the term harmony, 
which I've, I've dug into in the past, but the best way that I can describe how this looks, and this is so interesting to me because it's so real and everyone can understand this. If you're watching a band play, they're all playing different instruments. So you have the drummer, you have the singer, you have probably two guitarists, probably have a bass player. Maybe you have some extra instruments there, but you probably have five or six different instruments. Now you might look at that and get lost in the beauty of the music. But if you dig down into the details, what you'll find is that, well, they're not the same. The bass player is not the same. They're not doing the same thing as the guitar. They're not doing the same thing as the drummer or the singer. They're all doing different things, but they're doing it together. And they're not just doing it together. They're doing it together in a way that complements each other. So the bass player can't go up there and do whatever he wants. The drummer can't do whatever he wants. The singer can't just sing any note he wants. There has to be some kind of structure within that that unites all of them. And what that is, is, you know, to get technical with it, it's, it's the key that the song is in. So if it's in G, um, uh, you know, everyone sings uh, in that key. But then if you dig even a little deeper into it, if you look at the guitar player, if the, if the song is in G, he's not just playing a G note. If he's playing a G chord, he's not playing six G notes. He's playing a G note. He's playing a B note and a D note. So if you look deep into what we what a musician does, they're not all doing the same thing. They're all they all have their place. They're all doing something very specific. They're doing it very skillfully. They're doing it at the right moment. They're doing it structured, but they're also doing it somewhat chaotically because it's an artistic experience. And I think that analogy is so helpful because often we look at the world around us and we think to ourselves, well, we're different. We feel different and we are different. We're very unique. We're very individual. But then you might start to use that against yourself and thinking, well, if I'm so different, how can I fit in with the world around you? Or even like if you look at your family, you think I'm so different than the rest of my family. But a bass player would never not play bass because he's different than the drum player. They would never get into a fight about that. They have different roles. They're doing different things. And so stoicism is playing the right note at the right time in a way that complements the world around you. And I have to end on this one little example because this, this is probably one of the most beautiful sentiments that I've ever come across. And it's, again, it's crazy to me because it's true. This isn't some artistic crazy stuff. This is really true. If you go to a concert and the singer wants everyone to sing together, you're going to have good singers. You're going to have bad singers. Probably most of them are bad, especially if there's alcohol involved, right? Funny. <laughs> so, but they're all going to sing. They're all going to sing together. And anyone who's been a part of that, it's one of the most beautiful experiences you can have. But then you might ask yourself, well, if most of these people are terrible singers, why does it sound good? And that's a really great question. And the reason and the answer is, if enough imperfect people come together and choose to sing something, harmony is created, mm. meaning the imperfections of each of us, if we're all together doing it with the same purpose, in a sense, they cancel each other out. There's a harmony that's created. And this isn't a fluke. This isn't like it happened at one concert at one time. This happens at every concert when enough terrible singers choose to sing together. There's this beautiful harmony that's created. And so you don't need to be perfect either. You don't need to be the same as everyone else. In fact, you should be different. And you also don't have to play your note perfectly because if you're doing it in a community, it really doesn't matter. I love that. I'm also thinking about uh, just going to church and listening to everybody sing together too. It's the same thing. And it's re that's really good. That is really a good, powerful illustration. And it's just, uh, and uh, so to build on that, uh, when you take the, like the stoic, and they wouldn't call themselves masters. I don't think they would just call themselves philosophers. Um, um, they were in, and maybe you can talk a little bit about what a stoic philosopher was over against um, 
especially if anybody had the unfortunate experience of taking a philosophy class at a college, those aren't really, yeah. <laughs> it's right. debatable if they would be considered philosophers in the ancient world. And so there's a few exceptions, obviously, I'm not just being a little unkind here, but it, it, there's, a, there's a difference in understanding. And so what was the goal of the Stoic philosopher, given what you just said, so that they could participate in this, um, you know, this great, either be part of the band or being part of this great chorus of all humanity? Yeah, so the simplest, most modern way I can put it is you're required as a Stoic to develop your character. And they had a pretty good structure for this. They had the cardinal virtues, justice, wisdom, courage, and temperance. But fundamentally, it's how can I be the best possible person I can be? Not just for myself, but for my family, for my community, for the world. And also not just for right now, but in a way that propagates effectively through time. Because you could say, well, sure, We'll do, we'll be great people for my family, but then we're going to destroy everything. And then future generations, they'll have nothing. That's not very stoic either. So there's this idea of these circles of importance in stoicism, which is you have to get yourself in order. You have to get your family in order and you have to get your community and the world in order. And if you can align all of those needs in a way that, uh, that you can act upon on a daily basis, that is the most stoic action. And so really, to put it simply, it's they were very dogmatic about this. That's that character. They would say virtue is the only good in life, meaning it doesn't matter what happens to you. It doesn't matter if it's raining. It doesn't matter if if someone hurts you or what anyone else does. You have your way and your way is you have to be a good person. And it doesn't matter no matter what external circumstances befall you. You, can, you still have the capacity to be a good person. And that's entirely within your control. And do you think, um, just comment a little bit about like this revival, again, obviously stoicism never really died, but I mean, you hear, you have, well, your podcast, um, you have um, various people have been writing books on stoicism. I mean, Tim Ferriss, the, the big podcaster, that's how I found out about Seneca originally was from his podcast. There's like uh, what the younger man, uh, Ryan Holiday and the Daily Stoic. They just a lot of stoic resources. I even see TikTok videos about right. stoicism. Like given what you just said about what it is, how do you think that connects with the world that we live in today and why might, you know, or maybe even why was, why would a person like yourself or even, you know, myself, I, I find coasism is a, an operation, an, an operating system that fits really well with um, Christian faith, actually, because it sits on this Christ, uh, Christian faith sits on top of those virtues. But like, what's your sense of why this renewed interest in stoicism? I think what people are drawn to in stoicism is it's a very rational philosophy but it has a very deep spirituality to it. And, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of modern people are afraid of, of getting into religions now because they almost feel like it's unscientific and they're very, they're very cautious of that. There's science is, science is a new religion. Um, so anything that might come off as even remotely unscientific, people kind of take a step back from. So if you look at something like stoicism, and I think stoicism is actually... I'm going to get probably some heat for this, but it's, it's a very religious philosophy as well. I mean, philosophy and religion are very, it's, it's kind of hard when you talk about philosophy as a way of life and religion, it's hard to separate these terms because they're, they're very fundamentally similar. And, and there is, there is faith in stoicism and there is, there is a stoic God that is, that is nature. That's whatever's in the cosmos. There's providence, this idea of everything happens for a reason. So there are religious claims in stoicism, but it's also, it's unbelievably practical. It's unbelievably practical. And people can come into it right away and apply it to their lives. And it makes a lot of sense. It's very rational. So I feel like people come into Stoicism because they're not getting spooked away by some of the more spiritual claims. They go right to the practical elements of Stoicism. And then when you play around with the practical elements enough, you end up feeling this deep sense of spirituality which is underlying the whole philosophy, but it's not as, it's not as conspicuous as, as something like Christianity. And, and I, I love Christianity. I talk about it quite a bit in my, in my podcast, but I, I, I would say for most people, that's kind of what they're, that's why they're drawn to something more like stoicism. 
Yeah, and and again, like I we've I probably said this to, to you in, at some point, but like you can't read. I mean, Epictetus, especially if if you would just straight up read him, and like to say you were a Christian, you might assume he was a Christian the way that he talks. Obviously, there's some different definitions and stuff, but he's was always read quite profitably, along with Seneca and Marcus Aurelius, but especially Epictetus stuff naturally just fits right into spiritual formation. And and you use the you've used the expression several times, philosophy is a way of life. Talk a little bit about that. And also, um, do you use any of the stoic kind of practices that they use their spiritual exercises and maybe uh, just say a couple things about, uh, uh, about, uh, about how you've used those in your own life? Yes. Yeah, so I would say the philosophy is a way of life. The reason why I feel like it's important to separate that is because as you mentioned, if you go to university today, you end up getting like you know, philosophy 101 is lo- you're learning logic, like X equals Y. So Y equals like this kind of very dense, complicated thing. But it's kind of separate from philosophy as a way of life. Philosophy of way of, as a way of life is more like what values should I adopt and how should I, how should I act? That's the most simplest way of putting it. How should I act in the world to make my life better? And we can say, well, what do you mean by better? But really... That's the question that philosophy as a way of life aims to address. So it's, it's, it's somewhat important to separate the two, because a lot of times when you, when people think of philosophy, they think about that boring course they took in, in university, right? Um, in terms of stoic practices, there's, a, there's just a tremendous amount, which, um, which really, I think, is one of those things that draw people to stoicism, these practical, uh, practical practices. The very first is, which most people are familiar with, is the dichotomy of control, which is there's things up to you and there's things not up to you. This is something that people instantly latch onto when they come into Stoic philosophy because it's so helpful. If you're upset at work, you can take a step back and you can say, well, why am I upset? Is there something within my control that I can change to address this problem? If I can, I have a responsibility to do it. But if I can't, if my boss is just really upset today for whatever reason, he's taking it out on me, I have to understand that this isn't up to me. And so I have to detach myself from that. That doesn't mean you don't care about things. That doesn't mean you don't uh, uh, do anything because you do have to maximize your agency, but it does give you a bit of power over what's up to you and what's not up to you. There's memento mori, which is very infamous as well in in Stoic uh, philosophy, which is meditation of your death, which scares a lot of people away as well. (laughs) It's normally the last lesson you put in Stoicism because it scares people away, but, but it's not like you're thinking about death in a room, flicking a light on and off. You know, it's more like I am finite. I am going to die someday. I am not going to be here forever. So what are my priorities given that? What should I focus on? What should I think about? Should I be resentful right now? Should I be grateful? Should I should I hug someone or should I start an argument? It's really to prioritize your life in such a way that you make the most out of your life. And, and there's more I can go into. I would mention just quickly here, uh, a third one, premeditatio malorum, premeditation of evils, which is another great stoic practice, which is simply what could possibly go wrong. And we do this in companies all the time. This is what's so fascinating to me. Yes. If you sit down into a company, you're starting a project. One of the first things you do when you start a project is you say, okay, let's start a risk register. Let's list out everything that could potentially go wrong. The supplier is late. The quality is bad this person quits, whatever, you list all of that stuff out. And then you put next to it, what are we going to do if this happens? And you're not going to get everything that could potentially go wrong. But the idea is, if you think through what could possibly go wrong, and then what you can do about it, you're well prepared for when catastrophe does hit. And that's basically what premeditatio malorum is, what could potentially go wrong in my life? How am I going to deal with it so that if it happens, you have a plan in place, and you're not, you're not helpless. Yeah, and, and and we're going to talk about your coaching a little bit, but I've I've told people before if um, every coaching practice and every level of personal development is sitting right inside of Seneca and Epictetus, if you just read them and kind of extrapolate, and and I just wanted to make a comment on the the whole thing about premeditating on or, uh, yeah, what is it meditation? Well, momentum more meditating, uh, remembering your death. Um, made a list. I, I read Hado's philosophy and way of life when I was on vacation in August. And one of the parts that I thought was really fascinating is he's going through all the spiritual exercises and he started talking about that one. And then I was, um, and he quoted, um, like, I'm just going to read a couple of things, which is just really interesting. And then I added a couple of my own, like, um, 
uh, you know, like Marcus Aurelius, not to live as if you had endless years ahead of you, death overshadows uh, you. Um, you know, you just continually remember that. Um, uh, St. Anthony, who was one of the early monastics, said, live as though you were dying every day. <laughs> Mm. So it's the St. Paul, like in first Corinthians, he has, a, I die daily. Uh, Jesus, if anybody would come after me, let him deny self, take up the cross, which is functionally, I'm a dead man and I'm going to walk with a cross on my shoulder. I'm going to get crucified. I mean, so it's, it's just, right. this is where I always find it super fascinating. Because again, some popes, folks try to argue that Stoicism and Christianity are opposing views. And I mean, they are in in a certain way, just because, you know, Stoics didn't know who Jesus was. But what's fascinating is just the thread and the spiritual exercises. I mean, at the risk of, I don't know, my own reputation, I say they're almost completely compatible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and what do you think that does in the modern world, this whole kind of, a, it's because it's more of a front in the modern world to focus on your death, right? Because um, um, mm -hmm. most of us think we're going to live forever. We have a cult of beauty. Um, again, is, is there something about stoicism and it's realism that draws at least certain types of people today, would you say? I would say so, because I, I think one of the most difficult things that we've had to face with as a species is that sort of announcement by, by Nietzsche, God is dead. And he meant, you know, the, the, the deity of God and, you know, the Stoics had a, a slightly different kind of God, but, but yeah, I would say that, you know, you come into something like Stoicism, there's no beating around the bush with it. It's like, you're going to die. Think about that and prioritize your life. It's not, you know, be nice, be good. And then maybe someday things will be better for you. It's like, no, 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 you're, you're going to die. So what are you going to do? It's like, it's, it's very much focused on hard truths at the end of the day. And I think people gravitate towards that because we've lived so many hard, we, we've learned so many hard truths in the last, you know, hundred years, couple hundred years, the scientific discoveries that we've had to, had to deal with psychologically, which is no small thing. Stoicism, it still seems to be somewhat for the most part aligned with that i would say for the most part aligned with that if not entirely uh yeah for sure and i've wondered just the given the conditions of like the political climate um uh over the last decade we won't even just say the last couple of years but the extreme divisions that we see uh the chaos, the economic uncertainty that at least for everybody living today seems to, we've got a look all the way back to 07, 08 and the, the big crisis. Then we had a few years where it was better. And now we're back into this um, scary times and people, you know, if you go on YouTube and there's actually really smart people like, you know, like Ray Dalio, the billionaire investor saying, Hey, the next three to five years is going to be pretty tough. So you have this kind of chaotic world. And then I've wondered if, the fact that the Stoics were able to, again, create this way of living uh, that could deal with complexity and still build, you know, like the Cadeau's famous book about Aurelius, um, the inner, cit inner citadel, right? You can build this space where you get to restore your own agency in a world that seems out of whack. And I always think the Stoics, like they're living in the crazy Roman empire times. And it's not that we've gotten back to that, but in a sense, we're at a space where it seems like all the givens seem to be up for grabs again. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think it's, it's, I mean, we spoke about this early in the episode or maybe it was slightly before, but I think these grounding professions i think the more in touch you are with with nature the more you naturally have to adopt a stoic lifestyle it's like if you're in a if you're in a community a small community you have to be pro-social you have to rely on each other and to do that to be able to rely on each other you have to be reliable so there is this natural focus of having a good character and then as cities grow most people they stop knowing their neighbors and there's more of a, a bigger focus on, I would say, more the, the more super, superficial aspects of life. And you, you get away from some of that. You, you don't understand how the plumbing system works. You don't understand how the electricity works. Whereas if you're in a small community, you probably know the guy who takes care of the power lines. So I think the more we get down to this 
the more the closer we get to these. I don't want to say more barbaric ways, but let's say the more tribal ways, the more grounded ways of life, I think the more naturally you have to adopt a, a, a philosophy similar to Stoicism. That's good. Well, let's, um, I'm going to start winding our conversation down a little bit, but I want to talk a little bit about your, your coaching, um, even talk about the podcast. Like, how did you come up with the title Strong Stoic? I know you do strength coaching, so I'm guessing that has something to do with all that too, but just kind of weave uh, in like what kind of coaching do you do um and around strengths or around mentoring sure yeah so the strong stoic of of the idea behind it was so stoicism was all was pretty obvious i'm, I'm very fundamentally pro uh a stoic in my philosophical viewpoints but not entirely i mean i deviate on some matters the strength aspect. I mean, I've been strength training for a very long time. I would even say that I've learned a lot of stoic principles through strength training, because I also think for a lot of athletes, you need this stoic mindset to be successful because you need to be grounded. You need to be willing to face truth. You need good character again, because when you're competing, a good character plays off in long term. It's not a short term game. You certainly have to be willing to be good so that you can be invited to more games. So I've always been fascinated with this idea of strength. And I actually don't think that you can separate strength and stoic. I think for you to be a stoic, you have to be strong. Imagine something like courage, which is the cardinal virtue. Courage really means courage, how we think about it today. But it also meant something like fortitude, mm -hmm. which is strength. It's resilience. So it's not good enough for a stoic to be courageous if you can't back it up. Like if you're going to charge into battle, you kind of got to be skilled as well. You have to be a formidable force and only then can you really be stoic. So I think when you think about things like strength, it really is what, it, what a stoic is. In fact, the initial, um, who I can't remember the name of the guy, but he came up with these car cardinal virtues. He was one of the first that started thinking about these justice, wisdom, courage, and temperance. He was thinking about these in relationship to an athlete. So physical strength, but also mental strength, all of these things were so integrated in the ancient world that it was really hard to separate them. For me personally, I've always been a strength athlete and, and I, I strength coaching as well. And it just kind of seemed like something that I resonated with very much. And I'm very peculiar about which words I use to describe myself, or at least what I aspire to be. But I think strong and stoic is, is certainly among them. Uh, I'd say in terms of the mentoring thing. So I, I do mentoring. Um, I started off strength coaching a, a while ago and I still do a bit of that, but now I'm more focused on, I would say philosophical mentoring. And really what I try and do is I try and just guide people and give them some perspective on how they're approaching their day-to-day -day life. I'm, I really try and get practical with it. I try and imagine, I try and get people to imagine what their best possible life could look like? Like, where, where could I go in five years and 10 years? What could I do in the long term? What do I want my life to look like? And then I try and break that down very systematically into, okay, well, what do you have to achieve in five years for that to happen? And then what do you have to achieve in a year? And then what do you have to achieve right now? Like, what can you do today to make yourself successful for whatever you want to do in 10 years? And I'll give you just a, a quick example, because again, these concepts seem really abstract. When you give an example, it can be very helpful. I had a guy that I was working with who was very, very nervous, very anxious. He didn't, couldn't really, he, he was really introverted. So he, he couldn't really uh, speak with people well. He didn't meet a lot of people, but he wanted to be you know, like an IT manager or something like that. So I, I, I spoke with him and, and I said, okay, well, how, how good are you at you know, making friends, make like networking, building connections with people. And he said, well, I struggle with it a little bit. I'm a little nervous. And I, he also didn't like it. He, he wanted to kind of stay in his room and it's very introverted. Right. But I said, okay, so you have this goal of being an IT manager in order to do that. You need to have people skills. You need to be able to network. You need to be able to communicate properly. So that means that for you to get there in, in five years, let's say you want to get there in 10 years, in five years, you should probably have a lot of good, solid social skills. You should be able to introduce yourself. You should be able to shake hands. You should be able to just go up to someone, anyone and start a conversation. And so I said, you don't need to be able to do this tomorrow, but let's say if you can work on this next time you're at a social event, why don't you just go try and talking to someone or why don't you introduce yourself? And then what you're doing there is you're taking something 
that's achievable right now today. I can work on it today. It's going to be challenging. It's not going to be easy. I'm going to be nervous, but I can do it. I can work on it today and every day for a while. And if I do that, that's putting a little drop in the bucket that's going to fill up my big bucket, which is be an IT manager. And so I, I try and take something that seems like crazy, like so far off. How could I be an IT manager? Because I'm so nervous and I can't introduce myself to people and break it down. Like, well, no, this is achievable. What can you do today? What can you do right now? And what can you work on that's going to lead you there in the future? Yeah, I like that. And without trying to steal all your, your tactics and such, do you have like a favorite question? Maybe it's a favorite question you like to ask yourself or a question that you found really helpful for someone that you're working with just to give a little flavor for uh, your, your style. Yeah, I mean, it really depends on on the person, but I do like to ask that question pretty early on that that is, what would you like your life to look like? And, and I would actually, I often switch that it depends who I'm dealing with. But if I'm dealing with someone that's like myself, I'm a bit, you know, I'm reading Dostoevsky, I'm a bit more focused on the darkness, I would actually switch that I would say, who do you not want to be in 10 years? Because that is yeah, unbelievably good. powerful if you read notes from underground and and you can see you can make the connection that if i keep doing what i'm doing now i'm going to end up like the underground man alone in my basement writing notes to myself no friends bitter resentful angry at the world yeah you're, you're going to want to change a few things <laughs> so yeah i loved i actually liked it that's a very powerful question so i pre, i'm glad i actually asked that. that's really good and and also just out of curiosity what, what what's the difference? Because when you do strength coach, you're talking you're talking about weightlifting, I think. Is that right? So what's the difference yeah. between, say, calling yourself a strengths coach or versus like a, a trainer? Or is it really the same thing? Or, and, or do you do more than a trainer and you bring some of the actual like coaching kind of stuff into it? Yeah, the well, the strength coach thing is specifically strength sports. So it is uh, you know, powerlifting or Olympic weightlifting. I do Olympic weightlifting, but it's it's basically it's a more if you have a trainer, normally they'll focus on getting you healthy, right? You're, mm -hmm. you're probably doing a little bit of resistance training, but you're probably doing some kettlebell work or some dumbbells and some cardio functional training. If you're doing strength training, you have a goal, which is strength. And that has to be rooted underneath being a healthy athlete too. But there's a huge focus on becoming strong in a particular area. And that's always been what's gravitated that, that's always what I've gravitated more towards. Um, and, and again, it's just, it seems to be the case for me that you learn stoic principles through that. Like you need to be dedicated. You need to be able to, to carry a load. I mean, think about the Christian philosophy True. there, being able to carry a load, bear your cross, so to speak. And, um, and yeah, it's, it's been, it's been probably, it's been the most stable thing in my life. And I, I, I have a pretty stable life, but strength training is just, it's been there since I was like 14. So it's, it's been there before engineering. It's been there before philosophy, so to speak. Um, it's it's been there forever. That and music, I would say. No, I love that. I love that. And you you mentioned uh, music. So do you? I mean, you were able to. I was. You were able to give the, the letters on the GBD on the G chord. So like, do you play guitar, bass? What 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 is your, what is your favorite instrument that you play? Yeah, yeah. I've been playing guitar since I was nine. Oh, was cool. Learned cool. learned from a very young age and fell fell in love with it became I think I became pretty good at it and uh, I don't play as much as I should now but uh, I still go back to it it's still a, it's still a passion that I have for sure all right well I just th these last questions are the ones I like to ask every, uh, all my guests on here so and this one the first one's similar to one of your coaching questions I guess but like um, if you were going to like target out the you know the next 25 years and you know it could even just be five years but like you know what's what's next for you and what what you know what would be for you being those big goals that you'd love to hit over the course of your life yeah I read that question and I was thinking 25 years feels so long it feels like it's just a, a crazy long time I would say I'd like to be I want to keep going in, in the philosophy world I think that's something that's very stable I'm very lucky that I I learned what I like to do very young and I, I, I got to blame some of that on luck because I, I did I did have some good people around me that pointed me in the right direction. And I also just got lucky in choosing some things. But, um, you know, I love the philosophy stuff and I really want to build that. We're building the walled garden. It's more community based. You know, the Strong Store podcast is a, is a solo mm -hmm. podcast with some guests coming on, which I love. But I keep I want to just keep going forward with that. 
I'd also uh, like to keep building this organization, which I think, again, it gets back to, you know, the, what we talked about at the start of the episode, which is you, you can do so much more together than you can apart. You know, you need, you need community, you need to be pro-social and the wall garden seems to be a place where a lot of people that are similarly minded to me in dedication for truth, dedication for wisdom is, is going there. So I, I would like to, I would like that to grow into, um, honestly like the the philosophical society i think that's where that's our ultimate goal is, is to do that with the walk garden i still have a career i'm still an engineer i'm still a project manager and i want to progress further in that i'd like to excel in my in my career as well but i think i think i found what i'd like to do so i just want to keep trudging along and and see where that leads i also have to be open to the experience too because you have to be open you have to know what you want and you have to have a plan to get there but you have to be willing to uh, adjust your sales when the wind changes as well. I love it. Love it. And what's a typical day look like for you? Like, do you have uh, some kind of uh, like spiritual exercises that you do typically or habits that really form you and help you to stay grounded and continue to grow? Absolutely. Yeah. I would say <clears throat> I get up at the same time every morning, maybe once a week, I'll sleep in a little bit, but I get up, I like to get out and get some sunlight get, that gets me out into nature a little bit and, and get me to wake up a little bit. I love to start the day with a bit of reading, get that, you know, uh, get that learning started. What keeps me grounded after that, I'll go into a bit of work and get focused on that, which, which I, I, I tend to have quite a bit to do there, <laughs> but, um, what keeps me grounded and this is why I keep going back to the gym is actually the gym. There's nothing more humbling than the gym because a barbell can always get heavier you know, you, you never win in the gym. This is what's always fascinating to me. Some people think they win. They think, oh yeah, I won today. I got a new PR, but then I'll say, okay, well you, you enjoy that. That's good. But also understand at the same time that if I add two more pounds, you're not going to be able to lift it anymore. So the barbell can always get heavier and that keeps me very grounded. And there's also people that are much smaller than me lifting so much more. So that keeps me grounded as well. Um, yeah, I, I gotta say that that's probably why it just, it keeps me humble. It keeps me grounded. And, uh, like I said, the barbell can always get heavier. So as strong as you think you are, yeah, just, just add a bit more weight. Yeah. I love that. The barbell can always get heavier. Yeah. That's so good. That's so good. Um, I should have asked you this earlier, but I'm, I'm going to do it in the combination of this. I'm, I want to ask like what are two or three books that have really shaped you that you consider must reads. But I also meant to ask you like, who is your favorite stoic? And, uh, and so toss in there if somebody's interested in like learning more about stoicism, where you would suggest that they start along with the, if you wanted to touch on the two or three books, if we haven't already mentioned them since we have talked about some books already. Yeah, well, I would, I would definitely say notes from underground is a must read. As we mentioned, I don't want to beat the dead horse on that. The Gulag Archipelago is also, I think, just an absolute must read, especially if you're a Westerner, because yeah. nobody nobody in the West knows this history, which is mind boggling to me. So many lessons there. And I would actually say a book that I have to reread very soon is The Righteous Mind by Jonathan Haidt. This is just the, the pinnacle of modern moral psychology research. And so he, he really knows what he's talking about. He goes into such depth about understanding how we feel the way we do what morality is and just a tremendous amount of of knowledge and wisdom in that book that uh, is well aligned with a lot of the philosophical principles so i would actually absolutely, absolutely recommend that uh, and then in terms of the famous uh, or my, my favorite stoic rather you know it really depends who i'm reading at the time <laughs> i like them all i i think i tend to gravitate a bit more Probably to Seneca, I think because Seneca, he's a bit of a controversial Stoic, right? Because he, um, he, he was wealthy. He was very wealthy. He worked for the emperor and, uh, and, and the emperor was absolutely terrible. He was the emperor's advisor and he was, he was just a terrible, terrible emperor. He ended up, uh, Seneca ended up committing suicide on request by the emperor. He was sentenced to death, but Seneca just seemed to me to be a bit more of a wholesome Stoic. One of the misconceptions about Stoicism is that 
you know, everything is, everything is an indifferent in all externals are an indifferent in stoicism, which is true, but that doesn't mean that you don't enjoy externals. That doesn't mean that you don't care about things. So Seneca was very much focused on friendship, for example. And so the Stoics would say, well, friends are indifferent. They, but, but they don't mean that they're indifferent to you. They mean that they're morally indifferent. They mean that a friendship can improve your character and that makes it good, or it can make your character worse and that makes it bad. But Seneca, for me, he really, he seems to be the Stoic that most of us could be, like most of us could aspire to be. Like he talks about friendship. He talks about having joy in your house. He's very wholesome. He's very full. He's, and a lot of people separate that and they say, well, he's not a Stoic. But in my mind, that's actually what a Stoic is. They're very fulfilled in life. They're not dogmatic. They're not, you know, I'm not going to have any friends because they're externals and they're indifference. Like, no, I'm not going to care about my mother because she's an external. It's like, no, that's not, that's not the Stoic principle at all. But, um, but if you read Seneca, what you'll find is that there's a lot of just beautiful wisdom, beautiful sentiments in there. And, and, and again, something that I think is a bit more realistic that we can achieve. Yeah. Thank you very much. And talk a little bit about where folks can find out um, more about you. Talk about a little bit about your, where your podcast is, your own website, and also the, the walled garden. We've mentioned it a couple of times, but kind of lay out maybe a little bit about what that is and how people might be able to get, might get it or how they could get involved if they were interested. Sure. Yeah. So you can find me, I'm, I'm on social medias. So uh, Instagram and Twitter, I am, I have a website, brandontunnel.com, but I'm also pretty active on the walled garden.com. Uh, so the walled garden is, it's a philosophical society in some, and it's, it's been a project for this year that I've been building with uh, some other philosophers, very like-minded, Simon Drew, Juris uh, Bertolotti is involved, Kai Whiting, uh, Stoic author, Sharon LaBelle. Uh, there's a lot of just great people that I, I really do love getting involved in this thing. And um, it's, been, it's been a project that we've been building this year. The goal is to be a, a philosophical society. And what that means is a place where people can come and have community and can learn about various topics not just stoicism, but all, I think one of the, our fundamental value is that we're pro-social. We want to talk to everyone. We want to speak the truth. We don't want to, you know, uh, put fuzz on our words. We want just to get the truth out there and have deep conversations. We have Christians, we have Muslims, we have Stoics, we have all kinds of very, very philosophically minded people. As, as long as you're someone that's seeking wisdom in, in a way that, um, in a, in a pro-social way, I think the, the wall garden is a place where you can do that. So we offer mentoring there. We offer short courses and, and an ongoing podcast series. And so definitely check that out if you're interested. All right. Well, Brandon, I want to thank you very much for uh, the person that you are, all the learning that you're on and the way that you uh, are sharing that with the world. And most of all, thank you for spending some time with me and everyone who's listening here all the way to the end. It's my absolute pleasure. And I, I really appreciate you, Brian. You, like I said, I really enjoy all of our conversations. I love what you do. So thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, well, thank you. And thanks everyone for listening to this week's episode of the Deep Dive Spirituality Conversations podcast. Until next time, uh, sh show up, pay attention. God's got way more invested in this than you do.